Now that we've painted some simpler compositions, let's go ahead and start looking at some more complex compositions to see how we can use all of these same very simple concepts and techniques to apply them to any composition. And so for this one, we're going to be painting the Grand Canyon. And the Grand Canyon is such a great subject and you'll find, of course, lots of artists painting the Grand Canyon ideally from life if you get to actually go and visit. But in our case, we're just going to be using another photo reference from pixabay.com. And again, if you look at the original photo reference, you're gonna see that I cropped this quite a bit. This was really a very panoramic view. But the reason that the Grand Canyon is so amazing to paint is because we have such an amazing view of so much distance. So we can see for miles and miles because we're so high and we have a very clear vantage point typically. And so what we're going to get is a lot of really strong atmospheric perspective, which makes the painting so interesting. And the color variations are going to be very nuanced and fun to mix and of course, beautiful to look at. So again, I'm starting with a very, very simple drawing, keeping my shapes in the foreground kind of rigid and jaggedy. So holding my pencil very loosely, of course, just as I do with my paintbrush, because again, we're not really going for a very tight drawing or a tight painting. We want to keep it very whimsical and lighthearted. So again, don't get too wrapped up in the drawing. Just find some of these most basic edges that we need to distinguish. And I know that you can barely see it, but I just very lightly penciled in the most distant top of the canyon. And again, not trying to copy that shape exactly. And I think a good way to sort of keep yourself in check to make sure you're not getting too preoccupied with accuracy in your drawing is that the photo reference is just a jumping off point for you. People are going to be able to look at your painting and know what you've painted. And they're not going to say, hey, you know, there, there's an angle back there that you didn't quite get right because they're going to be looking at your painting. They're not going to be looking at your painting next to your photo reference and comparing them. That's just not what we do. We love paintings because they are made by us with our hands and they have that quality to them. So I'm going to go ahead and start off painting the sky. There's a lot of cloud coverage back here. So I want a little bit of value variation in my sky. So I have a little bit of lighter values over on the upper right hand corner of that sky. So I left that a little bit lighter. And then I went in with more violet on the left side. And now while this is still wet, I'm going to just very loosely start putting in the top of that most distant canyon. I'm going to allow that to just merge with the sky, whatever it's going to do. I'm just going to leave it going in with more pigment and less water. And that will help to control that edge just a little bit. But of course, because everything is wet it is all going to just merge together and create a really nice soft fusion. And now I am looking more at the canyon that I would say is in the mid range. So we have a canyon really far in the distance that is going to read as a little bit more of a blue violet. And then in the mid range, we're going to have a canyon that's a little bit warmer. So I added in a lot more orange and yellow to that, but we're going to neutralize it a little bit so that our most saturated colors are going to be in the foreground where the viewpoint is. So again, keeping this very abstract, very loose, it's all just a big wash of light values, soft edges, and bright colors at this point. And this is going to be the foundation for what we can build this painting upon. So that's very important to not go in trying to paint individual items in the painting at this point, but to kind of capture that overall sense of soft edges, bright colors, light values. And really, even if things at this point are not going the way that you thought that they should, maybe some colors are merging in ways that you don't necessarily like at this point, these are all going to be such light values that in the end, they're not even going to be noticeable. 
Now I just added a little dab of blue back here to this most distant canyon while this is still soft so that I can get some really nice soft edges here, but I don't want to overdo that blue. So I need to keep it fairly light. And I'm gonna get some blooms. And again, that's just another thing that you may not plan for, but I would say just let it happen because I think at the end of the painting, first of all, it's not going to draw too much attention to itself. And it's gonna add a lot of character to your painting. So now that I've dried this off, I'm gonna go in and I'm going to have some of these more distant canyons be a little bit more defined, but I need to be careful that I keep my values very light. So a lot of water in the mixture because I don't want to have too much contrast between the sky and these most distant canyon edges. Because again, that's just going to drag too much visual attention into the distance and make that seem like it's the focal point when really we want that to be there for context, but it's not the focal point. Really the foreground is going to be the focal point. So now I'm adding some warmer tones to this canyon side in the mid range, doing a little bit of dry brushing just to capture some of the striations of all of the rock forms. And what I really need to do for this canyon that's kind of in the mid range is I need to neutralize it. Right now it's a little bit too warm. Not a big deal at that point because we can go over those warm colors with some neutral colors and do a little bit of glazing to kind of tone those down a little bit. But that's something that I need to start thinking about at this point because when we have so many formations, which of course, all of these canyons are essentially made of the same materials. And so we get that bluish, violet, hazy color only because of the particles in the atmosphere that are kind of accumulating between the viewpoint and those cliffs. And that's what's kind of changing our perception of the color. And so when we're painting, we need to keep that in mind that even though all of these cliffs are made out of the same material. And if we were standing over on another cliff, it would look very warm and kind of have that reddish orange color to it, just like the foreground here. But because there's so many particles or molecules of, you know, atmosphere of oxygen between us and those cliffs, that's going to be what creates that nice atmospheric haze. And so we need to make sure that we are keeping those colors neutralized in accordance with that concept of atmospheric perspective. And as I move now into the foreground, I am going in with a really vivid, warm color, lots of yellow, a little bit of red, and just a tad of blue. I'm gonna start building up a little bit of that texture. So I wouldn't necessarily call this dry brush. I would, I would call this kind of a wet on dry because I'm not doing any scumbling, um, but I am allowing some of that lighter value just to show through. But what I need to do here is really start building up these more vivid saturated colors so that they are distinguished from the cliffs and the canyons that are more in the distance. And something that I hope that you'll start to notice as a pattern as we go through all of these paintings is that we are going to spend most of our time and effort in the areas of the painting that are more of the focal point. So where we want more visual interest, that's where we're going to really end up spending most of our time. And I mention that because it's important to know that with portions of the painting that are not your focal point, maybe they're more in the distance, it's really important to stop yourself from fiddling with those areas too much because they can become overworked. And the more time we spend on an area of the painting, the more attention it is going to take because we've put too much information back there basically. So we need to make sure that we're keeping those areas really more on the side of being undone or unfinished and very light and not have very much visual information in those areas. And then in the area where we want the viewer to spend most of their time looking, that's where we're going to spend most of our time painting. So at this point, I am going to leave 
everything that is in the distance and the midground alone, and I'm going to spend the rest of my time working on the foreground of this painting, building up some interesting textures, some nice dark values, and you'll notice too that we have a lot of plants in the foreground, and I haven't even begun to paint any of those yet. And that's because I really want to focus more on the areas in the foreground that are a lighter value. Of course, those plants are pretty much all a darker value. And so I don't need to worry about them at all just for the sake of the fact that I can paint in darker values on top of all of these lighter values in watercolor painting, which again is really the amazing thing about using a transparent medium like watercolor because we don't have to plan everything out ahead of time. We can really focus on the big picture first and then as we progress through the painting, we can get more into those finishing details. So right now I'm really just focused on building up the chroma or saturation of all of these rock formations in the foreground where the viewpoint is. And then after I have all of that in place, then I'm going to go ahead and start adding in some of those smaller details. So I went ahead and I dried this completely because now that I have a lot of the softer edges in place that I want, I'm going to start using more pigment, less water, and really building up some of the details here in the foreground. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to mix up a nice yellow green. So a lot of yellow pigment, and we do have to use a lot of that yellow pigment because adding too much water into that yellow pigment is just going to make that disappear on our paper because it's going to be too light. So because I want to put some yellow on top of some of these features in the foreground, I need a lot of pigment. And at this point, not very much green because we can, I'm sorry, not as much blue because we can add more blue as we go. Again, blue has a darker local value. And so it's really important to err on the side of being too light at first because we can go back in with the darks, but we cannot go back in and add lighter values with a watercolor painting. So you can see here now that I've kind of blocked in some of the plants that are more in the foreground, they're catching a little bit more light. And so they're going to be a little more yellow. I've got those in place. So now I added a little bit more blue to that mixture and I can start working on some of the plant life that's more in the distance. And it's going to be a little bit darker. And then this one that's a little more in the foreground as well. And you can see I'm making adjustments from the photo reference onto my painting. I don't have to paint the plants exactly where they're located in the photo reference. I can change that up for the sake of a better composition. So that's what I'm doing. I moved up one of those plants really to the immediate foreground so that there isn't so much empty space right there in that immediate foreground area. And as I add these, I wouldn't, again, call this a dry brush technique because I do have quite a bit of water in the bristles, but this is going to be a dry, or I'm sorry, a wet onto dry technique. So I'm able to control the flow of the water in the paint that I'm applying because there's not a lot of water in here. I've got a lot of paint, a lot of pigment, and enough water to get a nice transfer from my brush onto my paper, but I'm not at this point going for a dry brush technique. I will starting really at this point. And now I'm adding some darker value to the bottom of these plants because that's going to help ground them a little bit more so that they don't look disjointed or like they're floating. Gives them a little bit more depth. Of course, being sure not to overpower the lighter values that I had applied, letting a lot of those light values show through. So I'm being a little bit more minimalistic with these darker values. And a lot of times when I need a darker value on an object that's green, it's a good idea to actually add a lot more red into that mixture because red is the complementary color of green. And so we're going to get a nice contrast between the greens and then those darker values. And it's also going to boost the appearance of the greens to have a little bit of red in the mix. 
And here I'm starting to do a little bit more dry brush. So I'm not going into my water very much, only enough just so that the paint is more malleable and can transfer from my brush to my painting. And I'm going in and I'm looking at some of the crevices in the ground and again, adding a little bit more depth to some of the plants right at the base of them, just to give them a little bit more of a solid foundation. And this is the point at which I'm going to start evaluating things just to see if I'm really achieving enough depth. And if not, you know, starting to think about what I can do to overcome that. So I'm gonna go ahead and dry this off. And at that point, I decided to take a break and now I'm back and looking around this painting just to see what else needs to be improved because a lot of times when we come back, we can see our paintings a little bit more objectively. So I decided that I wanted to push those more mid-ground canyon sides into the distance. And so what I did was I used a very light glaze of blue and I just went over those mid-range canyon edges with a glaze of blue because that helps to create a little bit more sense of atmosphere and pushes those into the back so that my foreground, by contrast, is going to seem more chromatic, more saturated, and creates that really nice sense of depth in this painting. And now I'm going around the foreground again just to darken up some areas. And what I've decided here was that the solution I need isn't to add more darks, but it's actually to add more warmth. So I'm going to go over basically this entire area with a glaze of yellow. So this is just pure yellow. I have a lot of pigment here on my brush and I'm using that just to add some very bold strokes to the tops of the plants just to give a better sense of sunlight. It seems very brash at this point, but as the paint dries, it's really going to become a lot more transparent and subtle. And so now I'm adding a glaze over a lot of the foreground, especially where the value is lighter. I want to add a lot more yellow so that, of course, I have more contrast in my color temperature between the foreground and then the more distant canyon edges. And that's really going to do the trick for this. So again, it's very important if you are unsure whether or not your painting is done to get up, take a break, come back and you're gonna see it much more objectively. So now at this point, I'm pretty happy with this painting and I'm gonna go ahead and remove the tape and we'll kind of take a look at the final thing. And I want you to notice the differences between my painting and the photo reference. Again, the photo reference is just a jumping off point. It's not something that you have to copy meticulously. And your painting is going to be the better for it because it's going to have more of your personal touch and a lot more character to it. So use photo references as inspiration, as a jumping off point, as a guide, but make the painting something of your own entirely.